So let's talk diffusion and osmosis. Diffusion is the movement of molecules down a concentration gradient that is from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. Osmosis is the diffusion of water across a membrane. Now, the first experiment in this particular lab aimed to identify factors that affect diffusion. Specifically, the two factors that we aim to look at were temperature and molecular weight or size. So for this experiment, your instructor may have cut out some holes in these agarose plates, these agar plates, and they place two different substances inside of them. One of those substances was Janus green, which I will denote as being black in color here, and the other was potassium permanganate, which is purple here. Now we had two questions that were being asked. The first was, which will diffuse faster, a heavier or larger molecule, or a lighter or smaller molecule? And the answer, of course, is smaller and lighter always diffuse faster. Now the way how we know which one diffuses faster is as these molecules diffuse, you're going to start to see a halo of color form. The larger the halo, the faster the molecule diffuses, i.e., the smaller or lighter the molecule. Janus green was the heavier, and potassium permanganate was the lighter. So, on either plate, we should observe a smaller halo around Janus green than we do around potassium permanganate. The other question we had was, how does temperature affect diffusion? Now, if you think about what's happening on the molecular level at different temperatures, are molecules moving faster or slower when you get to higher temperatures? Faster. So, if I place one plate at room temperature, which is about 25 to 27 degrees Celsius, depending on the room, and I place the other in an incubator at 37 degrees Celsius, in which plate should I see faster rates of diffusion? 37. And again, that's indicated by the halo size. Now understand, with temperature, we're not comparing Janus Green and potassium permanganate anymore. What we're asking is, which potassium permanganate has a larger halo? In this case, it was the one on the 37 degree plate, letting us know potassium permanganate diffuses faster at higher temperatures than at lower. And we can do the same thing for Janus Green. Any questions about this experiment? All right, so I'm going to lump three experiments into one here because all three of them actually apply to one another. So I'm going to talk about the beaker and bag with sucrose. Then I'm going to talk about the two different cell types we observed underneath the microscope. And this is going to be indicative of both osmosis and we have another new term that we need to be familiar with. And that term is tonicity. <coughs> tonicity, or as you'll sometimes see it, tonic, refers to 
the solute concentration of one solution compared to another. So again, we have another comparative term. And there are three prefixes that we can place in front of this that will tell us the various levels of how this solute concentration compares. Now remember, when I say solute, what we're really talking about is the sugar, or the salt, or the protein, or whatever. Okay? It is not the water, it is whatever is dissolved in the water. So we're asking, how much more or less of this does this have than this other solution? And the three prefixes we have mean either it's higher, it's the same, or it's lower. Now, let's start with the prefix that means the same. You guys have seen this again and again in your lecture. When you had two atoms that had the same number of protons and the same atomic number, but different numbers of neutrons, they were called isotopes. When you had two molecules that had the same molecular formula, but different structures, they were called isomers. So what prefix means the same? Iso. So an isotonic solution has the same sugar, salt, or whatever concentration as the other solution. Okay? For the higher prefix, you go to a daycare center, you see one little kid running around with way more energy, a higher level of energy, what word do you use to describe that kid? Hyper. Good. Well, a hypertonic solution has a higher solute concentration. And finally, Okay, in medicine, if somebody's diabetic and has low blood sugar, we say that they are hypoglycemic. So hypo means low. Another easy thing to remember is that water always moves towards the hypertonic solution. So if you've got two solutions, one with a low level of solute, and one with a high level of solute, you're going to see water go towards the one with a high level of solute, making this one here the hypotonic solution, and this one here, bless you, the hypertonic solution. Okay. So the arrow always points at the hypertonic, and it always points away from the hypotonic. If you have two arrows going in opposite directions at equal rates, guess what? It's isotonic. Okay. So let's talk about the first exercise that you guys did, and we're going to compare it to these different tonicities and talk about what the water did. Now again, we were looking at the diffusion of water in this exercise, and I'll let you know too, these membranes that we used for our bags were selectively permeable, meaning only water can pass through them. Sucrose was way too big. So we had three beaker bag combos. Okay, the first one, we had water in the beaker, and we had 10% sucrose in the bag. In the second one, we had water in the bag, and 10% sucrose in the beaker. And in the final one, we had 10% sucrose in the bag and in the beaker. So, in this first example, I've got two different solute concentrations. And what I always like to do to figure out where the water is going to go, is I like to break it up by bag and beaker. So in the bag, I've got 10% sucrose which means that what percent of my solution is water? 90%. 90%. Good. In my beaker, I've got pure water. So what percent sucrose do I have? 0%. Good. Okay. And that means I've got 100% water. Where is my higher water concentration? In the beaker. Water behaves like any other molecule. 
it wants to go from the area of highest water concentration to the area of lowest water concentration. 100 is greater than 90, so water in this case wants to go from the beaker to the bag. Okay? So my water is going to go into the bag. If they ask you a question about this, please don't just write the word in. Okay? A lot of students do that. And they then, they then try and justify themselves by saying, well, of course, if I'm saying in, I mean into the bag. But you can word this two different ways. You can say that the water is going out of the beaker and into the bag, but you can just as easily say the water is going out of the bag and into the beaker. So please give one of the two when you use the word in. Into the bag, into the beaker. That way your instructor knows what you mean and there's no question about it. Okay? So, in this particular instance, water is going into the bag. So how does that describe the solution in the beaker based on solute? Is it hyper-iso or hypotonic? Hypotonic, right? So this is hypotonic. And the final question is, what does that do to the mass of the bag? It increases, right? Because water moves in. Was there a question? About the tonicity? Or is everybody good? It is hypotonic because remember we're looking at solute, the sucrose. It's lower in the beaker, meaning the beaker solution is hypo. But what could I say about the solution in the bag? It's hyper compared to the beaker. So there's two tonicities we're always looking at because it's a comparative term. Typically, when they ask this question, they're almost always asking about the solution outside of the bag or the cell. Okay, they'll specify they want to know the cell or bag's tonicity or the solution surrounding it, but usually they're always asking about this. Okay. Now, in the second example, we flip the solution in the bag and the beaker. So now, where is my hypertonic solution? Is it in the bag or is it in the beaker? It's in the beaker, hyper. Remember, it's solute. We're looking at sucrose. So this solution here is now hypertonic. What is the tonicity of the solution in the bag? Hypotonic. And water always moves away from the hypotonic into the hypertonic solution. So it's moving out of the bag, right? So what am I going to see to the uh, happen to the mass of the bag here? It's going to decrease. Good? And finally, this final example here, 10% sucrose in the bag, 10% sucrose in the beaker, what do I got? That's, That's an isotonic solution in both the beaker and the bag. So what am I going to see happen with the water? It's going to go in and out at equal rates. Don't just say nothing, because water never stops moving. It's always going to be moving. In, in this case, though, it's so moving in and out at equal rates. You say that water is moving in and out of the bag at equal rates. Mm -hmm. So what am I going to see happen to the mass here? It's going to stay the same. Alright, so now we're going to take the idea of these tonicities and what the water is doing at each, and we're going to apply them to cells. So in your first exercise with cells, you took three different tonicities of solutions, A, B, and C, and you placed red blood cells inside of them. Solution A was an isotonic solution. Solution B was a hypertonic solution compared to the red blood cells solution. And solution C was a hypotonic solution compared to that inside of the red blood cells. So when I dropped my first red blood cell into the isotonic solution, what direction does the water move? Does it move out of the cell, into the cell, or in and out at equal rates? In and out at equal rates. So did it change the shape of that red blood cell at all? No. no. I have this nice circular erythrocyte, and water moves in and out at equal rates. That's an isotonic solution. That's exactly what we saw over here with the bag. Now when I drop the red blood cell into a hypertonic solution, where is the water going to go? Out of the bag. Remember, water is always moving towards the hypertonic solution. So that means in this case, the red blood cell solution is hypotonic and water is leaving the cell. 
what does that cause the cell to do? Shrivel or collapse, right? So it looks kind of like this. Don't confuse this with an explosion. That is not an explosion. That's the best I can show you of the cell collapsing, okay? And that's because the water is leaving the cell. So for that, what you're really looking for are the jagged edges on the sides of your cell. And that's because red blood cells have what as their outermost structure? A plasma membrane, right? It's not rigid. So when the water leaves, that cell collapses just the same way a balloon would if you were to let the air out of it. Okay? It's just collapsing. In the final example here, in a hypotonic solution, we drop the cell in a solution that has a lower solute concentration. Where is the water going to go? Into the cell, right? So it goes into the cell, causing the cell to swell and expand. And then eventually the pressure gets so great that the cell does what? It bursts, it bursts or lyses. So think of this like you're filling a water balloon and you don't take it off of the faucet before you fill it too far. It explodes. Okay? So our cell lyses and the water literally rushes out of the cell and that's because all of the water was moving into the cell causing it to swell and that plasma membrane which is not rigid eventually just ruptures and the cell bursts. So this is with animal cells. How much other word do you use? What's that? Uh, Hemolyzed or what much other word do you use for that? I this one it. here? Yeah. Lyse. Lyse. L-Y-S-E-D. Anytime you see lyse, like hydrolysis has lysis in it. Lysis means to break apart. That's literally what the Latin and Greek of that word mean. It means the process of breaking down or breaking apart. All right. Now, let's talk real quick about the two plant cells that you looked at. In one of these instances, you place the plant cell in water, which is a hypotonic solution. And in the other instance, you placed it in 20% sodium chloride, which is a hypertonic solution. Now when you place the plant cell in a hypotonic solution, what direction does the water go? It goes into the cell, just like we saw here, but does the cell burst? Why not? Because it has that cell wall, that rigid cell wall. So the cell becomes fully pressurized. It does not burst because of its very, very firm cell wall. And we commonly refer to this state as turgid. That is the preferred state of most plant cells. It allows the organism to actually exist upright. If we place a plant in an isotonic solution, the cells exist in a state that we refer to as being flaccid, and it causes the organism to wilt. Okay? So turgid, when we place it in a hypotonic solution, but then what happens when we place it in a hypertonic solution? Where does the water go? Out of the cell. Okay, good. Now the cell wall doesn't collapse because again, very firm. But what does collapse? The plasma membrane. Good. The plasma membrane collapses and pulls all of the chloroplasts in close together. We refer to this state of the plant cell as being plasmalized. Again, it's got lysis in it. The plasma membrane is literally breaking apart or breaking down. This is a lethal state for the plant cell. And, and I've got pictures of both of these along with these two on my website. Right? So, final exercise, and then we're done, was the selective permeability exercise. This one won't take that long. Because all we have to talk about is what we expected to see and how we tested for them. So, what you did in this exercise was you took five different solutions to test selective permeability. What does it mean to permeate something? To pass through, right? So, so permeability means to pass through something. And selective means that the membrane is selecting 
what can or can't pass through. Now, with our membranes and our cells, they select based on two things, size and chemical aspects like polarity versus non-polarity. In your experiment, we were only selecting for one characteristic. It was a physical characteristic, and it was the size of the molecule. These membranes allow everything smaller than a disaccharide to pass through them. Okay? So if it's a monosaccharide or smaller, it can pass through the membrane. So what you did in your group was you, in theory, did one of these five different solutions, or you did a mixture of all of them. The first solution was sodium chloride, the second was sodium sulfate, the third was glucose, the fourth was starch, and the fifth was protein. You're asking a very simple question in this exercise. Which of these molecules will diffuse out of the bag into a beaker of water? So on this side here, you have water, and you pull from your beaker at the end of this experiment because you wanted to know which of these passed through and got into this water. Okay? So real quick, this is the question we're asking, which of these are passing through? Let's go ahead and eliminate two of them that we know for a fact will not pass through. What is larger than a disaccharide that I have up here on the board? Protein is, so it does pass through, and starch. Starch is a polysaccharide, so that's more than two sugars. It's much bigger than a disaccharide. And proteins are made out of many amino acids, so they're pretty big molecules as well. Now, just to make sure these didn't pass through, we still needed to add a detection agent to try and see if they were there. So what did we use to try and detect starch? Iodine. Iodine. And hopefully we saw that reddish-brown color, which means no starch. Then what did we use for protein? Fireet. And again, hopefully we saw that blue color, meaning no protein passed through. What was the other color on the iodine? On iodine? Brownish red. Remember, that's the negative result for uh, starch. All right, so that leaves these last three. So we tested for glucose. Now, what solution did we use to test for glucose? Benedict's. And again, what's the final step in Benedix to make it develop? You have to boil. Now, with the glucose, what most of you probably saw was not a full-fledged positive. If I had to guess, you probably all saw it turn the Benedix kind of a nasty greenish color, maybe with a brown tinge around the sides of the tube. We call that a slight positive. It's not a full-fledged positive, but it does mean that the glucose was moving out of the bag and into the beaker. Okay. The final two solutions you had to test for were the sulfate ions, so you're only testing for this, and the chloride ions, and you're only testing for that. Now, are those two things larger or smaller than a molecule of glucose? Smaller, much smaller actually. Okay? So, we expect these two to move out of the bag and into the beaker. Now, what solutions did we use to test for these? Let's start with sodium chloride. What was our detection agent? Silver nitrate. Silver nitrate. Good. What did we expect to see if we got a positive result for this one? A whitish color. Usually it's kind of a cloudy white. And what did we expect to see if we got a negative? Clear. Clear. We didn't really see any color change. Good. Okay? What did we use to detect sulfate? Barium chloride. Barium chloride. Now, if you ever get confused over these two, there's a very easy way to remember that you don't use barium chloride with chloride ions. Barium chloride already has chloride ions in it. So it would kind of be asinine for us to detect chloride ions with chloride ions because it would always be positive. But what were the positive and negative results for those? White and clear. So white if it was positive, and clear if it was negative. And again, with both of these, hopefully what you guys saw was a positive for each because they were smaller than glucose. Now your mixture of all of these was just meant to show that even when we mix all of these molecules together, 
these three should still pass through the bag and go out into the beaker. And hopefully that's what you saw. Okay? So I believe that's it for today. Have a great spring break and good luck studying. You said the color was green, right? Yes, slightly green. Sure.